Hi, my name is Ryan Languish, and this is Ludo Lodge, a channel about sparking growth for game designers. And today I'm going to be continuing my series on prototyping in Tabletop Simulator by dipping into the topic of scripting, which I know is a very hot topic that a lot of people are interested in. Um, because it's a lot of what makes Tabletop Simulator very cool, or at least maybe um, modules that you've used before or played, you've seen elements of scripting that do cool things with the game. Um, and I think oftentimes it can feel very daunting or in inaccessible if you've never used it before, and especially if you aren't coming from um, a programming background or experience with programming. So the purpose of this video is really to kind of do a beginner's intro to just kind of some of the things you should know if you're interested in, in learning scripting in Tabletop Simulator. Um, and I'm kind of coming from the perspective of assuming you don't really have programming experience necessarily, though if you do, it'll certainly help. Um, but I think even if you don't have programming experience, I wouldn't let that um, scare you away because I think it is something that you could learn and this is a great kind of environment to kind of um, start playing around with some of those things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what, what do we mean when we're saying scripting in Tabletop Simulator. So Tabletop Simulator is obviously this you know physics environment um, for playing board games that has a lot of this functionality that's baked into the software such as handling cards or rolling dice or doing all these different things that you would expect from a game. But where it goes a step further is it says, okay, we're not going to limit to you to the functionality that the developers of the game have put into Tabletop Simulator. Rather, we're going to give you the ability to extend it with your own functionality that you might want to add depending on your specific um, use case or what you're trying to do. And the way that they provide that, that ability to extend it um, is through really giving you two things. Um, one is the access to um, a scripting language. In the case of Tabletop Simulator, it's the language Lua. And the second thing is access to um, an API, so the, the Tabletop Simulator scripting API. The scripting API is basically what the developers have provided in terms of here are all the different functions that you have at your disposal to be able to make changes to the Tabletop Simulator environment. Um, and so there are specific things that they um, are have rules around how to use and, and you have access to to be able um, to implement the functionality that you're, you're wanting to implement. And so you can think about it this way. Lua, as the scripting language, is basically going to allow you to structure logic in how you want your extensions to Tabletop Simulator to look. And then the scripting API is ultimately what that logic is going to utilize to influence the environment and make the changes that you want to make. Now in this video, I'm going to touch a little bit on um, the usage of Lua in a very basic context and obviously through um, tutorials and scripting and tabletop simulator, that's going to be something that's, that's used is, is Lua and all of the examples. If you are completely new to programming or even just new to Lua, I linked in the description a really good article just going over some of the basics of some of the syntax and rules and just kind of get you up to speed with some of that. Because um, that is part of the learning curve of, of learning to script in Tabletop Simulator is simply learning that language, which isn't specific to Tabletop Simulator. Like Lua is used for a lot of things outside of just Tabletop Simulator. Um, but you need to learn the, the grammar and how to properly structure Lua code. Because if you've never programmed before, basically a programming language has a bunch of rules about how it needs to be structured. And if you break those rules, it's going to throw errors. It's not going to run. It's going to say, this is not valid Lua. So learning how to write within the syntax rules of Lua is going to be a, a big part of the learning curve. Um, but hopefully seeing examples and maybe reading an article like that can help um, to make a lot of that more natural. Your other big tool is going to be the documentation for the Tabletop Simulator scripting API. And so if you go to that website, you can see detailed descriptions of every function and every piece that you basically have at your disposal and make up all the building blocks that you have to work with. And that's going to be something that you reference regularly, um, even if you're experienced in, in programming in Tabletop Simulator, probably referencing back to just remember specific things. So let's take a look at what scripting kind of looks like or how you access it within Tabletop Simulator. So if you go up to the modding section here and click it, you'll notice there's a scripting section. And that brings up this scripting window. 
um, which at this point just has one tab here that says global. Throughout um, doing some of the scripting, additional tabs may open here for different objects in the game. And you'll see the code here. This just has kind of some example code, um, which I'll, I'll kind of look walk through in a second. Um, but then we have a few options up here. First, we have this Lua tab and then a UI tab. So right now we're in the Lua tab, which is going to be the Lua code for this particular um, thing, which right now is the, just the global um, object. But UI is going to be using kind of Tabletop Simulator's relatively new um, XML UI system, which is for things like if you want to create buttons and user interfaces um, within Tabletop Simulator, this is a way that you can go about doing that. Um, and so we'll, we'll show a little bit of that later in this video. Um, but then we have this option here that says save and play. And this is actually a very important one to understand. It says save scripting changes to the last open save and reloads the game with any script changes. Any changes that were not script related will be lost. So when you click this button, it's going to basically apply all the new code that you've added into this window. But it's basically going to reload whatever the last save is with those new code changes. Now what this means is if you made other changes to the mod, such as adding objects or moving objects around or anything kind of in the, the non-scripting environment, be, if those aren't saved, those are going to get lost because it's going to load the last save and then apply the scripting changes. And so that can be an easy way to accidentally lose things that you thought or like if you create a new object and then try to add scripting on it and then press this it's going to load, but that object was never in the save file. So it's going to be gone and your scripting changes are going to be gone because the object they were attached to is gone. And it's, it's just something you have to be aware of. And I think the, the most typical way to kind of go about scripting is to start from a place where the game is kind of laid out on the table exactly how you want it to be. And that's saved as your save file and then go into scripting so that while you're doing most of the scripting, there isn't a lot of like adding and removing of objects. It's mostly just making scripting changes. But that's a very important thing to know is if you make a change to something else and you want it to stick around, you'll first want to go to games here and you'll want to, you know, overwrite your save file to make sure that that gets in there before you actually save and play um, with your scripting changes. Um, another thing to mention is that this editor where we're editing the code here isn't a very nice text editor like it's not very feature rich it's very basic and you can edit it all here and that's what I'll do for this tutorial um, it's worth mentioning though that the official documentation recommends actually using um, the text editor Atom A-T-O-M um, and they actually have an officially supported plugin that can be used with Atom to get a lot of like auto completion of functions and I think there's some automatic um, trans like auto loading into tabletop simulator while you're working I may go into a little bit of that in future videos. For purposes of this video, I'm just going to work directly um, in the script editor here. So before we get too much further, I just want to establish some, some basic terms that in the, in the scripting environment of Tabletop Simulator are good to be aware of. The first is just the concept of an object. Basically, an object is any of the you know, components or things on the table um, that might be out there. Um, so if we come out here, I have a couple objects here. I have a checker and I have this giant 12-sided die. Um, and objects, when I talk about the scripting API, an object is something that in the API has a bunch of functionality attached to it. So there's a bunch of functions that you could call on an object and that'll, um, you know, do specific things. And we'll go over some examples of some of those in this video. The other thing to know about objects though is if you right click them and you go to scripting here, You'll notice that it says that the GUID is this, you know, six alphanumeric, six long alphanumeric string. And that's the globally universal ID. So it's basically that ID specifies this specific component. If I make copies of this component, they're going to be the same in every way, except they are going to have new GUIDs because they are technically different instances of that component. Now, GUIDs are going to be important because anytime in the scripting we want to reference a specific object, like maybe I want a specific object to be moved to a specific place on the table, I'm going to reference the G GUID. And that's why here they make it that if I click this option here, it's going to copy it to my clipboard because that's a common thing that I might want to copy it to then paste it into a script. Another concept in Tabletop Simulator is that of a player. So 
right now, um, I'm the only person in here, but I can select a color, you know, and there's all these different colors. And typically, if you were playing a game, you'd have everybody have selected a color and you're playing the game. So when you're scripting, there's kind of two concepts of players. There's players as in everybody that's in the uh, room at that time. And then there's the concept of seated players, which means players that have actually selected a color and are considered to be kind of in the game. And so there may be functionality where you specifically want to do something only considering seated players, because maybe the game scales from two to four players and you only want to do the one, you know, however many people are actually playing the game. Um, so that's kind of another concept that we have in play is this idea of players. Now, if we hop back into the scripting window here, um, I talked about how this right now, the only one we have here is this global script. So basically we're going to have um, two different types of scripts. There's gonna be the global script, which is here, which is kind of just um, not attached to any object specifically. It's just kind of globally available and is gonna globally have the code in it um, trigger. But at the, the other thing that we're gonna have the opportunity to add code to is specific objects. So if I come out and I come to this object and I go to scripting and scripting editor, you'll notice it now opened another kind of tab here um, that doesn't have any code in it because I haven't added any code to this die 12. Um, and I, it's worth mentioning that if you labeled your components, it would update these here, which can make it a little easier um, to keep track, like if you had a bunch of these open, knowing which component is which. So any code that I put in here is gonna be specifically kind of applying to that component, that specific object, whereas global is gonna be more globally. Now, there's gonna be a lot of times where you maybe could do something either way, like I could put something in the global code or I could put it in it for the component. This gets in a little, a little bit into just kind of like programming best practices. But generally, you want to keep the code closer to the object that it actually um, is related to or the object that kind of owns that functionality. So if I have something that's specific to this die, I should probably tie it to the die instead of like in my global script finding that die with its GUID and then adding functionality. It helps for code organization. Like if you're going back through and trying to find things, it's a lot easier to find things if it's not all in one file in global but it's actually associated with the different objects. So if we take a look at this uh, global script here, which has some basic um, kind of placeholder lines in it, um, there's a few things to point out. The first one is that in Lua, anything beginning with two dashes or hyphens is considered a comment. If it has two dashes and then the little brackets and then the, the same kind of mirrored closing, that's a block comment. So it's gonna comment everything that's within it. All a comment is in a, in a programming language is is kind of notes to anybody looking at the code. So this is just telling you things that might be useful if you're looking at the code. But when that code actually gets run, all those comments get stripped out. They're not actual code, they're not gonna get run, they get thrown out, um, and anything that isn't commented is what's gonna actually um, get used. The second thing to notice here is that we have two functions. We have a function on load, function on update. These are both examples of what are called events. And when we're talking about the tabletop simulator scripting API, one of the big things that it's giving you access to is a variety of different events. And events are very important because they're kind of what determine when you trigger any specific code. So for example, this event, this function on load is defined by tabletop simulator. Like if we named this something different, like on load ready, now tabletop simulator doesn't know what this is. At this point, I would be defining my own function, which we can do, and I, I'll get into that a little bit later. But when we do onload, that's defined by the scripting API to be a specific event that tabletop simulator is telling us whenever the game is loaded for the first time, this function is gonna fire. And when I say the function is gonna fire, that just means all the code that's in this function, kind of in between the function and the end here, is gonna, gonna trigger just one by one down the line. Now in the case of right now, it's just a comment. And if you remember what I said about comments, those get thrown out. So this is not gonna do anything. On load, it's not gonna do anything. But let's actually, for example, uncomment this. So let's take out this comment block and put this in here. So this is now doing this print function, which is a function that in Lua is going to just print out this text 
specifically into the chat window. Um, and so what we can see now is if we save and play, we can see down in our scripting window here, we see on load. It said loading complete and then on load. And that's because it triggered our function and it then ran this line, which printed that to the console. And you know, we could change that to whatever we want. You know, the classic uh, programming first step is to do a hello world program that just literally prints hello world. And so we can do that. And I made a mistake because I accidentally deleted my end here. So that's an example of, it's easy to make mistakes, right? There I violated the syntax of Lua. Lua says when I have a function, that function needs to have an end to specify the end of that function. But now if I run this, I see hello world and all is well. So that's our first event that's kind of shown here. Our second one is this on update, which is actually gonna run every frame. So you can think if this is if this software is running 30 frames per second or something like that, this is gonna trigger 30 times a second. So if we print something here, um, you know, maybe I print, oh no, because this is not great. Um, and hit save and play, like our chat is just spamming, oh no, over and over and over again, because 30 times a second, or it's just spitting out this text. So there probably aren't going to be a lot of things that you're going to want to stick in on update. Like what, what do you really care about checking 30 times a second or doing 30 times a second? So you want to be careful about putting things in there, but you do have access to that. And so this kind of gives you a, a look into what scripting and tabletop simulator is going to look like. You're basically going to have a, events of some sort that you're going to then attach code to that calls other functionality from the scripting API so that when those things happen, you trigger other functionality. Um, I mentioned that these are built-in functions, built-in events into Tabletop Simulator, but that you have the ability to define your own functions. So a function is just a, a group of code that's then given a name that then you can call that, that name in other places and it'll run all that code. So let's see an example of this. If I wanted to define my own function, I could come here and say, um, say hello. That's the name of my function, put end. And in this function, I'm just gonna say print hello there. Very exciting. Um, what I can then do is up and on load here, I can call my function. I can put say hello like this, and if I save and play, you'll notice it printed hello there. And the reason is when it triggered on load, it, I then told it to run say hello, which comes to my defined function and does all the code in there, which in this case was hello there. So functions allow you mainly code organization so that you can um, group the blocks of code under logical names for what that code is doing, and also code reuse so that if I have five places that I'm using the exact same logic, rather than copying the logic in five places, I can put it in a function and then just call that function in those five places. The big advantage to that is say I want to change that functionality. If I had put it in five places, I now have to make that change in five places. If I used it in a function, I just have to change it once in the function and then all the function calls are going to handle updating everywhere else properly. So again, I'm getting a little off track into kind of programming best practices, but I think they're good things to be aware of just kind of on the front end as you're, as you're getting into this kind of thing. So at this point, we've kind of touched on some different things and printing into the console, but we haven't done anything useful or anything that interacts with the environment. So let's actually do something that um, is a little bit more concrete of an example. I will mention, Nothing I do in this, this session is gonna be particularly useful or something you would actually use. It's really kind of just meant to give that foundation so that in future videos, I can kind of go into more specific practical examples and, and people that maybe you know are new to this can, can have this video to give them that familiarity before then. Um, but let's go and let's actually open up the scripting editor for this big die here. And let's add in an onload function. So again, that's a built-in function that is gonna, when the game loads, run, run whatever code I wanna do here. 
And inside here, I can reference, because I'm in an object script, I can reference that specific object by using the keyword self. And then if I put a period after that, that's now gonna allow me to call any functions that that object is aware of. So in this case, every object in Tabletop Simulator, every component, gets access to a bunch of different functionality that the scripting API defines for an object. For example, one of those happens to be the randomize function. So you might know in Tabletop Simulator that you can right click a component like a die and choose to roll it or randomize it or hit R as the shortcut. This is basically the equivalent in Lua code. And so if we now save and play and quick close this, you can see that my die actually rolled. Um, it was a little hard to catch there, but it was rolling at the end. Let's actually try that again. So if we come in and we go to scripting and we go save and play, we can see that it rolled and now it was a three where it was a five before. So we've now made it so that every time the game loads, this die is going to randomize itself. Not very useful, but starts to get into kind of how we can tie real functionality in Tabletop Simulator to some of these events that happen. As one final little example, let's actually um, play around with, let's say we wanted a button that when you press the button, it randomized this die. Um, Tabletop Simulator provides you the ability to put in things like buttons, like actual user interface buttons that people can click on, which is pretty useful if you're adding kind of scripted functionality and you want certain things to happen. Common examples might be you click a setup button and it sets up all the pieces or uh, click a button to refresh a row of cards and it'll fill in all the empty spots, which are the types of examples that I might go into um, with future videos. But let's just go over just a quick little example of adding in a button. So if we come here, and I'm actually, one thing that you have to know about buttons is they need to be attached to an object, which is why I have this random checker here. I could put it in global, which would basically make it a, a button that's almost like all these buttons that are up here that are kind of like on top of the whole environment. And when I scroll around, they stay in place, which might be what you want. You may want to add like some just buttons that are kind of, always accessible, but here I kind of want it to be in the game world, so I'm going to atta attach it to this checker. Now I mentioned that we have a Lua tab for, for our checker, and then we have a UI tab. What We're going to use the UI here to basically add a button, and there is a way through the Lua code to also create a button, and that was kind of the original system for adding them, um, but the UI system is kind of a nice way to kind of split out your kind of user interface elements from then the logic that's in the Lua um, file. So here, the way we're gonna do this is it's gonna look, it's, it's gonna be in an XML format. So if you've ever seen like HTML with a website where, that has a lot of tags that have the little um, less than, greater than angled brackets, um, that's the kind of format we have here. So in this case, we're gonna have, um, a button is basically, going to have tags that look like this. So we have kind of our opening tag and then our closing tag. And that's just kind of what XML format is going to look like. But then what we're going to do here is in between the tags is whatever text we want to be on that button. So in this case, I'm going to say roll die. But then inside of this first tag, we're going to have the opportunity to define a bunch of different characteristics about this button. So the first one we're gonna define is basically what function in our Lua code do we want this to call when it's clicked? Because we wanna tie functionality to this button, right? So we need to tie that to a function. So the way I define that is I set on click equal to whatever I want my function to be called. So I'm just gonna call it um, roll die. Okay, so that's gonna be, and we're gonna to have to end up going and defining that in the Lua code here in a moment. The second thing I'm going to do is define a position, which is basically going to be just an X, Y, Z value of how it should be offset from this object. It's going to be relative to this checker. Um, so I'm just going to do here zero, um, negative 100 for the Y to just bump it underneath the checker, and then zero for the Z. Next, we're going to add a width. So let's just do 200 and a height. Let's do... 50. And so obviously you could play with these to kind of figure out what, 
what looks good and work, what works for you. So now we're going to want to go, and actually, let, let's just run this real quick. So if we save and play, and we look here, we can now see that our checker has this little button here. Um, and obviously, you know, it's kind of small. This is, <laughs> this is not a very good, compared to our massive die over here. Um, but this button, and you notice when I hover over it, it, it kind of shows that this is a clickable element. But right now, if I click it, nothing happens, right? It shows up there, but nothing happens. And the reason for that is simply because we said when this is clicked, we want to call the roll die function, but this doesn't have any roll die function. So it's trying to call something that it's not finding, so nothing happens. So the next step is we want to come in here and we want to define that. We want to say function roll die um, and end. Um, I'll quick mention the, so these parentheses here, every function is going to have those parentheses. And so far, I think all the ones we've looked at have been empty, but they won't always be empty. If you have a function that has kind of a comma separated list of names in there, that's saying that that function has parameters that get passed to it that then do something in the function. So for roll die, we don't need to tell the function anything. It's just going to roll the die and that's fine. But there may be some other thing where maybe you need to pass it text or need to pass it a value and then it's going to um, use that in the function. And that would be handled within these parentheses. So what do we want to have happen when we click this button? Well, the first thing is we want to specifically roll that die, that giant die. So remember, this is just our checker that's handling this button. So the way we're going to interact on a specific object is by getting that object by its GUID, which I mentioned earlier. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new variable, which a variable is kind of just like a storage box for any kind of information we want to put in it. And we're going to store in it a reference to our die. And so I'm going to put local die equal to, and don't worry, I'll, I'll explain kind of the breakdown of this real in a moment here. We're going to do get object from ID. So this is a built-in part of the API. So that's something that the scripting API is providing, telling you, hey, if you call this function and pass me a GUID, I'll give you the object back. That's just functionality that's given to you. Now, how are we going to get what the GUID is? Well, we are going to come out here real quick, if this wants to close for me. We're going to come over to our die and go scripting and copy this to our clipboard. So then when we come back here, we can, in quotes, we should be able to paste that into our code. So now this is saying, for this specific ID, give us that object. And then we're going to store that in a variable called die. Now this local here, technically we don't need. We could, we could go without this. And it's really getting more into the to kind of a Lua, um, and kind of programming concepts. But basically, if we don't have local, that's saying that this is a variable that is globally accessible. So even outside of this function, if there were other places in the code that we referenced this, it would be pointing to the same variable, the same box of information. However, if I put local, I'm saying, hey, this variable, I only need it within this function. Like after that, it's not going to be accessed anywhere else. Um, and so, Generally, if I know I'm not going to need something anywhere else, it's best to use local, which really just gets to kind of the how variables are handled in memory and just good programming practices. All you really need to know is at this point we have a variable called die, and that variable is holding our object that we got by its GUID. At this point, we can now call functions on that object, just like before we did self.randomize. Now we're going to do die.randomize. And so it's the same concept here where before it was self because we were in the die's own script. Here in the checker script, we got the die and then we're going to call randomize on it. So let's save this and see if we made any mistakes. So this still rolled because it rolls on load. But now we should be able to click this button and it's got an error. Here's a good example of us um, troubleshooting on the fly, unplanned. So let's go back in and see if we can figure out what we did wrong. And so it turns out, looking at this, what I did wrong is I simply 
didn't call the right function. So I called get object from ID. The actual function name is get object from GUID. And so this is an example of, you know, basically the error we got said error in script function attempt to call a nil value, which basically said, you know, I don't know what this is, but you tried to call it like it's a function. And so, you know, Lua throws up its hands and gives us an error. So now that I've updated that to what it actually is, let's see if that fixes it. So we come in here, and if we click the button, we roll our die. What a thrill. And so we can click this any number of times, and it's basically the same as if we were, you know, hitting R or randomizing the die directly. So at this point, there's nothing in this video that you're going to immediately be like, ooh, that's useful for me to use and implement in my, in my game or project I'm working on. But I hope that it maybe gave an easy kind of exposure into what scripting looks like in Tabletop Simulator and some of the core concepts so that as I go into some of the more um, detailed and more practical examples, you feel like you kind of have an understanding for what's going on. Like I've been saying, I am planning on following this up with some practical tutorials and examples. That's I have some ideas, but I'm definitely open to, if you have ideas for things that you've, you've seen in a game or things that you, you would like to implement in your own project, um, post those in the comments. I would love more ideas of what would be useful examples to kind of run through. I would love if you uh, enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel so you, do, so you don't miss out on those videos. Consider liking the video. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. I would be happy to answer them down in the comments below. Hopefully you found this useful and I will see you in the next video.